The monastery had been d- destroyed <laughs> multiple times. <laughs> Multiple times. <laughs> Multiple times. <laughs> Multiple <This> times. <laughs> Welcome back. Beer Brackets, everybody. Today's a special episode. We're reviewing an extremely significant beer in the beer history, in the beer life of myself and Alessandro. <laughs> the Leffe Blonde. <laughs> for us growing up, man, starting off in our beer journey, discovering beer. It's a major brand. It's a big beer brand that everybody can get. I think internationally, this beer is pretty easily to Mm -hmm. get. It's pretty well accessible. So I think most people, depending on where you're watching from, whether you're watching from the UK, whether you're watching from Europe or North America, South America, I'm pretty sure you've seen this beer, can get this beer pretty readily available. I think it probably to your local grocery store, at least I can here in Montreal, I can go to my local, any grocery store. And pick up a six pack of Leffe, the blonde especially. For me, the brown I can access as well for you. That's either not I accessible or probably a little that. harder to find. There's an interesting history to talk about there with is. this beer. But I think maybe before we get into that, I'm in the mood for storytelling right now, man. I think we yes. need to talk a little bit about a little bit of the background of what this beer means <laughs> to us. And you, you growing up in northern Italy, like yes. a small town, right? I think this beer was. was pretty significant for you, which is very interesting, at least to me. You're absolutely right, my friend, and I'm very excited actually that we are finally reviewing this somehow. Like yeah. we've uh, we've dodged I it know, a couple finally, of times, uh, but like you said, like yeah, I grew up in a little town northwest of Italy. Funny enough, like the first time I tried uh, this beer was actually on tap because the local hmm. pub uh, that's so cool ha- happened to have it as an offering on tap. The, this pub is La Ruota, which means like the wheel. It's in this little town uh, where I grew up. The owners like had like this very nice beer selection. Leffe happened to be one of them, specifically the blonde. The first yeah. few time I, I got to try it, I wasn't convinced because it was, you know, mostly coming from Lager, Pilsner. So it's it's quite a bit of a jump coming from there and stumbling oh, upon, definitely. The, you know, like an Abbey Absolutely, style man. ale. Yeah. Right. So it took me a little bit of adjustment, but then really it grew on me and it became one of my, you know, one of my favorite, like go to, you know, it came in this very unique special glass, uh, which we can talk about in a little bit. But yeah, that was kind of like my first encounter with this amazing beer. The Leffe chalice (laughs) with the stained glass window engraving on the stem. Right. Like you were saying, kind of like a tactile element to the glass where you can run your fingers. Over that little engraved stained glass window. I still Absolutely. remember I, that. Yeah. <laughs> I remember you telling me that, how the Leffe was kind of like the the party beer, right? If you were having like starting a night out and you want to get a little <laughs> buzzed at your local bub, pub there, you would go and you order the Leffe. That's exactly. that's really interesting, man. And to think about it, like I've been to your parents' house, like where you grew up yep. in Piedmont there. And like I we drove by the pub and it's really, it feels like very... Not rural, but I mean, you're very much in the countryside. Yes. And to think that like, you know, growing up over there and you go to this little pub and like having this beer on tap in your teen years and like that's Mm -hmm. pretty significant as a young Alessandro, a young beer explorer, this beer definitely holds a significant place for you. And what's interesting for me, I mean, I I love that story on your end. That's, I love thinking about that. For me, it was kind of like my introduction to Abbey Ales. And whether you consider this an Abbey Ale or not, it's obviously Abbey Ale inspired now being brewed by AB and Bev. It is still brewed in Belgium at the Stella Artois Brewery. So at least it's still brewed there. So it is still a Belgian import. Whether you consider it a Belgian, like an Abbey Ale or not, this was kind of my first introduction into this style of beer. Because, you know, the, the higher alcohol percentage, kind of like the sharper carbonation, like the thicker body to it, more flavorful, maltier. It really kind of was challenging to the palate of a beer drinker, somebody who was used to just drinking lagers and pilsners and maybe the occasional Guinness. For some, you know, somebody coming from that world, this was something that was very challenging. So it was kind of my gateway beer into that world of eventually, you know, these beers that we love today. It just holds such a special place, my friend. The abbey that it was brewed in originally, this monastery, it had roots back to the 1200s. And so this special order of monks, you know, lived and took their their slumber in this abbey, my friend. (laughs) What they would do, they were known for being very sociable. 
This was one thing, and it says specifically on the Lefa website, they were a very sociable order of monks. And so what they would do, they would take in pilgrims. So pilgrims would come to this, <laughs> this particular monastery because they knew that they were very hospitable, but also they brewed a delicious beverage that they would serve to pilgrims that were coming through and staying with them at the monastery. And because at the time there was so much sickness going around and plagues, they would serve beer because beer with, you know, through the past, the boiling process, and it was just pure. And so it was much safer than drinking water. And so they developed their beer making skills all the way back then in the 1200s, my friend. And people would go on pilgrimages to drink this particular beer. Bang, I, I got to stop you and ask you, can you yeah. imagine how hospitable and friendly they were specifically during the Lent time that we've learned is a <laughs> high consumption, <laughs> beer consumption time. <laughs> Extremely high consumption around Lent. <laughs> Sitting around all day drinking the beer. <laughs> and it would get pretty pretty friendly, I'm sure. <laughs> no doubt. I'm, I'm absolutely sure they got pretty friendly within the walls of that monastery. Another fun fact that I found really interesting and ties into beer bracket lore extremely well. Ooh. So they're saying during the 1800s, so what happened, like brewing had actually stopped for a period of, I think, two, 300 years. But what had happened is because in the 1800s, apparently... <laughs> The monastery had been destroyed multiple times. <laughs> multiple times. Multiple times. <laughs> multiple this? times in beer battles. Again, I don't understand. I don't understand why people back then had kept trying to destroy these beer making monasteries. But can you just imagine like these these beautiful, wonderful monks taking in pilgrims and feeding them beer and just raiders coming over the hills to destroy and, and pill I don't understand. What was with all the aggression, man? You know, this aggression will not stand, man. I don't understand it either. It, seem, it seems to be like it's almost if you go back, like you can make a compilation of how many times we're saying this. You know, it's every it's time there's a monster. <laughs> it had been destroyed multiple times over the years in many, many epic beer battles, and it was rebuilt. <laughs> You know, like all these raids and, and all these beer battles that have been waged over the years, I'm not surprised that all these monasteries have been toppled and destroyed over time because if the monks are drinking this liquid bread continuously, how would they defend themselves? <laughs> if you take time to read into beer history, this this narrative is insane. It's constant. It's, it's, it's almost like monastery and beer like equals like destruction. It's like something, <laughs> something in that equation. constantly rebuilding. <laughs> It has to do with the beer drinking. It has to, right? That's the only common thread. It has to be that they just can't defend themselves against the simplest of invaders it, who are trying possible. to <laughs> encroach on their walls. And they just, they can't, there's nothing they can do. <clears throat> it's, Anyways, uh... So <laughs> in the 1900s, the beer making tradition was revived by one good monk. And again, you know, it was eventually purchased by AB and Bev, who they say carry on the traditions and now brew the beer, as, as we said, at the Stella Artois Brewery, the main brewery in Belgium. They maintain that they have kept this, the traditions, the recipe, to the best of their ability. Is it the same as it was back in the early, early 1900s? <laughs> who knows? Who knows? Who knows? You know, we'll see how it does in the review setting. At least for me, with this uh, great journey we've been on together, I think you will agree probably with me that this uh, is a fantastic beer for the fact that it gives the opportunity for a lot of people that are not familiar necessarily with Abbey-style beer and Trappist beer to get a hint of it and an introduction to it without necessarily being too shocking. It's probably, of course, not the best example of like if you go into tradition and specific rules and how they should be done and et cetera, et cetera. Right. But for right. how readily available it is, I think this like holds a, a very important place because for me, I can say like this is probably the beard that grew my appreciation for those styles. And if I had never had it, probably maybe like I wouldn't like any of the other beers. So, you know, something there has to be said about that. That's a very good point you just made, my friend. That's very true. It's a gateway. It's the gateway beer. The gateway beer to happy beers. Beer. <laughs> All right, buddy. Let's get this review started. We have been sawing beer for long enough. Let's crack let's these blondes it. and let's, let's see what it. we think. Let's do it. And I get to How use my will... Christmas present. <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. How will the left blondes do in a beer brackets Ooh. beer review? Oh, good memories. Memories. <laughs> yeah. Beer memories. They say beer, beer memories, memories are the best kind of <laughs> memories. 
Got to save a bit for the mouthfeel refresher. Oh, look at this already. A nice carbonation. Ooh. Aroma cheers. Aroma cheers to you, my friend. Aroma cheers. I'll let you start. What do you think? Hmm. See, it's crazy to think to me. It's, it's just like you now that, that we just discussed. It's the beer noise. Oh, yeah. The beer speaking. It is. It's it telling is. us about the, the beer the beer raids of the 1800s. <laughs> it's just all those. <laughs> the, the monk could not protect me. The monk was too drunk. He fell asleep when the raiders came. Very crackly. It, we it need is. that beer sound category. We should have it, my friend. We should have it. Now that we just went through the little story of me drinking this and being introduced to the style uh, with with the Leffe, it's funny how for me now it almost smells and has, like toned down compared to a lot of other beers in the style. But still, yeah. it's very recognizable. And this this is probably the thing that I like most about Leffe is that it has that classic Belgian yeasty character with clove yes. and a hint of banana, but without being like overpowering. I find it very clean. Uh, so it's very, very polished. So you have those two notes, but they're not overly complex. I think I'm going to start with the two, my friend, because I, I quite like it. There, there's, I'm sure, a little bit of nostalgia there, like in the sense that it's very recognizable. It, it gives you a very good idea of what the style can be. Yeah, the one thing that strikes me about the aroma of the spear is that I, I guess that you get hops off of it. You're not getting too much maltiness. I can almost like smell the alcohol on it a little bit too, mm, on the aroma. Yeah. <clears throat> I think that's very distinct to it. Like when you said, when you first took a sniff and you're like, oh <laughs> yeah, memories. I think, <laughs> yes. yeah. I think that smell is very unique to left for me. Um, I also get it a little bit in Unibrew's beers. Uh, that might mm, there might be some kind of comparison. Um, there might be some kind of parallel there to what that yep. aroma is. Maybe I'm interpreting that as alcohol. Maybe it's just either the yeast or the hops or just something to do with the way the beer is prepared. But there isn't too much to it aside from that. Actually, for me, I'm finding the aroma to just be a little bit muted. There is some character there, but nothing that's really enticing mm -hmm. me too much to go in for a sip. Just. There's an aroma. <laughs> Something yeah. to smell. I'm actually going to go a little bit. I'm going to go with a 1.5 on the aroma. Uh, just because there's nothing interesting there. So now, buddy, taste. Cheers. Cheers. Take mm. a sip. Let me know what you think. Mm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's very familiar. <laughs> oh, is that just like a beer time capsule for you? Oh, it is. It is, man. Like, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, but it's interesting Bringing how... Bringing back all the beer memories. It, it, it is. It really is. But it's interesting, memories. again, how much lighter it feels compared to how I remember it. Like, in terms of... Because <laughs> right? now lighter... we're used to drinking all, like, ABT12s and all these 10% beers. <laughs> yes. All these 8% yeah. triples. <laughs> but, yeah, no, but absolutely. In, in terms of alcohol, 100%, it's definitely l lighter in, in that sense. But also just in terms of, uh, like you said, a little muted on the taste as well for me it's all about the banana and clove like immediately yeah, yeah then it, it hop bitterness like hits you get this nice multi presence but it dissipates uh, really quickly yeah. i think i'm gonna again like there might be a little bit of element of nostalgia here but i think i'm gonna stick with the two because i think everything is in the right place that's there, a good way of putting it, it. it it's almost leading towards the 1.5 but probably that element of nostalgia and the fact that I find it quite, quite, quite enjoyable for what it is. Like I think two is where I'm going to land. What do you think? What it does is it's very light. Like you said, it's very subtle in its characteristics, but it's easy drinking. And I'm guessing that's what they're going for as just a nice blonde. If you chilled this or you have it on tap on a hot summer day, even, even though it's 6.6, .6, you know, I can imagine sitting out on a, on a terrace or something on a, you know, under the sun and with a chilled sort of, chalice of of left blonde and enjoying it a lot so i see what they're going for but there just isn't much there but it's good so i'm gonna go with a two i think a two's fair i'll i'll match you on that one buddy and now mouthfeel <laughs> the Let's best beer bracket tradition or one of our traditions it is the best it's one one of our our oldest traditions how about exactly this? i find it quite pillowy i don't know if i've ever used it's this, very pillowy uh, 
yeah. uh, term, but it, it's almost like a weird uh, carbonation. It's it's because extremely fine bubbles taking a bite out of whipped cream. Let's let's yeah. put it that, way. that same kind of like the, yeah. this explosion that leaves you with nothing, right? Mm. And it, especially like with after the refresher, mm -hmm. I find it it very light on the mouth. 100 percent, um, man. Yeah, you can still feel the alcohol though, which which I find a little uh, almost like in contradiction mm -hmm. to this. You feel this pillowiness, but then you can definitely feel the alcohol presence. Yeah, one point five because I think this really? to me is yeah to me the the to me it's like middle of the road. What do you think, my friend? It's funny. I actually really enjoy the mouthfeel of this beer. I think it's it's nice <laughs> and sharp, really strong carbonation. Like I said, it is a little oily, but I think that's okay for the style of beer. I think it does it justice, and because the taste is so muted, I think the fact that it is a little bit oily or sticky is just a little bit of character sticks around mm. to the finish, which we'll talk about next. I'm enjoying it, man. I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick with the two. I think it's not bad. It's not bad. I, I enjoy it. I think it's probably one of the best features of this beer for me personally. But now the finish. This is interesting. I got a lot to say. I got a lot of bones to pick with this finish. <laughs> All right. And this is where it's going to come out. It almost starts uh, with those same characteristics that you get on the, on the palate uh, and yeah. on the nose for that. Like you have the clove, you have the... Um, you know, the banana, it lingers into a little bit of that hop. That alcohol presence really starts to build up. Like to me, it starts. Which is weird. It's a 6.6% beer. It's not like it's an 8, 9% beer. Right. right? But but it, it almost feels like it, it, if, if you told me that it was a 10% beer, I would probably say it, it's a little light to be it, but I, I would probably believe you. Right, because, I agree. Because, yeah. because it's almost like right yeah. after the carbonation hits and it cleanses the palate, then you start feeling it and it never right. really stops. I think that that has always been a little bit of the characteristic that I've never really enjoyed about this beer. So that's, yeah. I think that's bringing it down to a one for me, especially now that I've had beers that are higher in, in, in ABV yeah. in a similar vicinity, it definitely would go with the one. What do you think, my friend? That's the thing, right? It's like, it's 6.6, .6, but you would think by the finish that it's like an 8, 9% mm -hmm. beer. It just doesn't make sense. I've had Abbey Ales, Trappist beers that are 8, 9, 10% that mm -hmm. don't have as much alcohol in the finish as this does. And maybe that has to do with the fact that now being brewed by AB and Bev, maybe there's like a little bit of the wizardry was lost. Maybe it's that's possible. what it was. And maybe this beer 30 years ago was different. May, I, I don't know. There isn't that masterful wizardry that we've seen in other Abbey Ales to hide the alcohol. That just doesn't exist here. And for a beer that's this light and lacking as much character on the taste that it does, you would think that you wouldn't get that strong alcohol kick on the finish. And that's my big gripe with it. I mean, a little bit of hop, a little bit of malt, mm. but it's mostly just like that sour bitterness from alcohol. <laughs> like, oh, I'm going to agree with you, man. I'm going to go with the one, two. I'm just... <laughs> Breaking it down category by category, it's not like I'm not enjoying this beer or I don't like it, but it's like as a finish on its own for yep. what it is, it's just not that good. But as an overall beer experience, buddy, from beginning to end, what do you think about the Lefe Blonde? I think on the overall is where everything tied in together. I yeah. think I'm going to give it a two, my friend, because I, I really think it does it, it, it does represent and showcases what that gateway is yeah. and and i think that it, it it does it well enough i don't think it's necessarily the best example that exists but the yeah. fact that it's so available and that you know right. for me is a mind-blowing that like in a small village in in italy you can get it in a you know and on tap and enjoy it and grow an appreciation for it yeah man i agree i had a friend who came over last week and you know i'd bought a six-pack of these for the review mm -hmm. uh, we each had two of them like really quickly over you know while talking and they went down really easy we enjoyed them it's like it's a very it's a nice beer it's a good beer to just sit down and drink casually there's nothing wrong with it breaking it down category by category sure we found faults but it was an overall beer experience i'd agree with you man i would be happy giving it a two on three i think it's it's very enjoyable like it's a good accessible gateway we'll use that term again into abbey ales into things that are a little bit stronger than the regular lager or pilsner and i think this is probably a lot of people's introduction to those beer styles and for that i think it deserves some good props so we gave scores in the you know to different categories in different <laughs> places but overall we pretty much had the exact same score and that is a 2.83 am i correct on five which is a good beer what do you think is this was this your gateway beer into abbey ales let us know down below let us know. Tell us your story. 
tell us your love story. And whatever you know, click that little, you see that little beer bell down there? Click that beer bell. Because if you don't, even if you're subscribed, if you don't click that beer bell, YouTube's not gonna let you know when we're in the pub. So you're not gonna be able to join us for a beer and hang out for a little bit. So click that bell. That would if be you sad. want to, if you want to join us at the pub. And no matter what, don't forget to close your beer brackets. Never forget. <laughs>